And I'm going to switch over and talk about black water systems. And these are primarily surface systems. I used to say that there were no blue holes in these black water systems, and I've been forced, as I've learned more, to realize that there are a few blue holes in black water systems. And if I had just thought about it um, from my youth, I would have remembered some from the Swanee. I just thought there was none in Georgia, but there are. There's a, there's a handful of blue holes in the black water systems, but these are primarily surface water systems. That's why they're black. So this map again, real quick, black water country in Georgia is from the edge of that Pelham escarpment to the coast. That's, that's black water country. What's a black water system? What does that even mean? The base flows are slow and <coughs> steady with big flood events that can be 100, 1,000, 10,000 times bigger than the base flood. They're very flashy. They're naturally flashy when that rain comes and it runs off. Um, there's a real high floodplain width to channel width ratio, which is another way of saying when they flood, they're very wide. Um, the Satilla is two, three miles wide in places when it floods, and that's quite natural for it to do that. Um, very low gradient, which means drop of feet per mile. There's just not a lot of drop to these rivers. That, the color comes from tannins and humic substances, from the leaves and twigs and other things that are in that swamp and in the river itself. Um, high transmissivity, low turbidity. That, that's a way of saying this water is actually very, very clear when it's in its natural state. Uh, you, if you put on a mask and snorkel, I mean, looking in it, you wouldn't think it's very clear, but if you put on a mask and snorkel and lay on the bottom and look up in six or eight feet of water, you can see the trees. It's, it's, it's real clear. And uh, that's a, an important feature for the animals and plants that live in it. Low pH, which means it's acidic, and this can be quite a range from from almost vinegar or, or lemon juice up to about six and a half. Um, oligotropic, that's a fancy way of saying they're very low productivity. There aren't a lot of kilocalories. There's not a lot of biomass produced per linear foot or mile. And it's detrital based. And this is interesting to me as a fish biologist because a black water stream functions pretty much the same way that a trout stream in, in the mountains functions, which means there's not a lot of algal productivity. All the productivity is based off of the leaves and other stuff that falls in it. And then that's processed by bacteria and fungi, and it's eaten by progressively larger critters, <coughs> insects, etc., and then the fish eat it. So that's where the food comes from. The food comes from what's given it its color. And the only reason a trout stream is not black water, and I, we actually found some um, up in North Carolina that are, uh, the only reason the trout stream is not black water is because it's flowing too fast to gather up that tannin and that humic substance. So that's that's what a uh, that's how a black water stream operates its energy budget. That's how it actually works. Um, and it has real high, as a result of all that, sediment oxygen demand. That's what SOD is, which means there's all this out, there's all this uh, bacterial and fungal stuff going on with the leaves and twigs at the bottom, and that's consuming oxygen. So it, as a result, it has naturally low dissolved oxygen. Now, it's not so low that a fish can't live in it, but it's naturally low, which makes it sensitive to changes, meaning if you put more stuff in it, that's going to consume oxygen, you're going to tilt it over. If you put a lot of sediment in it, you're going to tilt it over. You're actually, you tip this ecosystem into something that won't work if you load it up with stuff. <coughs> so, what do black water systems look like? We're definitely preaching to the choir here because y'all live in black water country. Y'all know what they look like. This is a shot of the lower satilla. And the reason I'm going to run through these is because there's actually a fairly high diversity of black water types. This is a little creek on the Satilla with a beaver dam. That's a very typical uh, scene in South Georgia. Here's where a little creek comes into the Satilla. You can see how clear the water is. You can, again, you can 
you see how clear the water is there. That's 13 red breast beds for all you fishermen. And I'm not going to tell you exactly where this spot is <laughs> because they're there every year. Um, but you, you can see how, how clear that water is right there. Now this is a black water system that's cutting through limestone. You can see stuff like this on um, the Wipacoochee. This one, this is actually on the swine where it's cut down into the limestone. This is a black water system that has the benefit of a lot of spring input. And so it's really lightly stained black water with some Florida and aquifer input. And there's an actual spring, a crack, a crack in a rock that's putting clear water into the black water. Um, this, is, this is down in North Florida. And then this is probably the quintessential black water system, real low pH, real high blackness. Um, this is an Okie Pinocchio swamp where that water's flowing real slow and there aren't any blue holes. You gotta look at this one for a minute to see what's going on. But this is a map of changes in wetland density, wetland acreage over time. And I'm just gonna let that kind of run through for a minute. The dark purple is hardwood wetland. We'll draw your attention to an area right up there. That's the Satilla running through there. There's Lake Ross. This is Oki Pinocchi Swamp. I want you to take a look at an area right up there, kind of a triangular area. Mm. You can see how that wetland just disappears. Something real similar happens right here on the northwest side of the Oki Pinocchi. These, these wetlands just disappear over time. And over here, I believe that's the alapahol. You can see what happens in the alapahol um, bottom over time. Now, I probably don't need to tell you how this happened, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Here's some statistics. In the Satilla, we lost about 25% over that time period and a real similar percentage in the Ogeechee. Different number of acres, but a similar percentage of wetlands lost. And I think that's a probably in that 25-30% range is what's happened in the upper swan here where we are. It's, it's probably in a similar range. It surprised me if it was higher or lower than that. So how did that happen? This is a topo map from the mid-90s of that triangular area I was showing you in the Satilla. It's an area called Zero Bay in the Little Satilla Branch. And you can see that lattice work of canals. It's a, uh, na nature usually doesn't build things at right angles to each other. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are human dug canals that were funded with federal money. And then the timber companies the landowners then connect a network of private ditches to what I call the federal ditches. This all happened starting in the late 60s and the 70s, and then by the early 80s it was over. Um, this is what a typical silvicultural operation looks like with bedding, a road, ditches on both sides of the road. Um, that's about an 18-inch ditch running down the middle of a of a wetland area. So you still have the core hardwoods right around that ditch, but what's been changed is what's out around it, away from that, that core area. This is a ditch in Waycross. We also dig ditches so we can put subdivisions in, and we did it as early as the 1930s. So it wasn't new in, in the 1960s, but it's just been intensified. This is an old ditch in Camden County. That's a, that's a federal ditch. That one is about 15 feet deep. There's a shallower ditch with about uh, 30, 35 year old uh, cypress trees growing up in the middle of it. So it's been there a while. This is a recent ditch. This is US 82, uh, just close between here and Waycross, close to Waycross. And this is what I call a rim ditch that's all the way around a hardwood wetland. They didn't get in the wetland. Now the wetland used to be bigger than that. 
but they didn't get in the jurisdictional weapon. They just dug a rim ditch around it, connects it to this other ditch right here, and then they then they dug two more ditches out into that ag field. And what they were doing is converting it. These are some friends of mine, the Mixons, uh, that they were converting it from uh, growing tobacco and cotton in rotation to growing blueberries. They were dewatering it a little bit because acidic dirt, old wetland dirt, is good for growing blueberries. So it's, this is still going on, and it's mostly lethal, what's going on. This is not. This was an illegal ditch into a little cypress head to build a subdivision uh, in Brantley County that went belly up and has never been built, but the damage was done. That's me walking up the ditch, and that bottom photograph is where the ditch was headed up into that little cypress head. This was to dewater this area so you could grow houses instead of crops. And this is a subdivision just outside of Brunswick. Gives you an idea of how wet it can be, and it still reverts to what it used to be uh, when it rains a lot. A wetland is a wetland. It's always going to be a wetland. Now, it used to hold water for a long time, for months. Uh, now it just holds water for maybe 48 hours, but if your carpet's wet or your septic tank ain't working, um, it doesn't matter if it was wet for 30 minutes or if it was wet for 30 days. Um, we have subdivisions being built in wetlands. So that's just a short way of saying that. So what's happened? The water flows a lot more quickly to the ocean, a whole lot more quickly than it used to. South Georgia flushes like a toilet these days, by design. Uh, those up legs on that hydrograph and the down legs on the hydrograph are a lot steeper, so it happens in a shorter, a shorter amount of time, which means that summer flows are really deep, and that stays, the rivers stay down for a long time, uh, and, and they blink. This is a quick little plot of the Satilla. You can see that it's not really doing anything different than it used to do in terms of the flow levels. It's just getting there a whole lot more of the time, even in wet years. That's, that's what's going on. It's just more frequent. So you've got a river that's become a ditch, and it just stays real low, and you start growing stuff along the edges of those white sandbars. You can see that there. And if you add a little bit of nutrients to it in just the wrong place, it turns into something that's not a Blackwater River at all. You see algae in a Blackwater River like that, that is not natural. That is not supposed to be happening. And you're destabilizing the economy. Um, this is a fire tornado. I don't know if you've ever seen one, uh, but this was at that fire just this side of Waycross uh, back in 07, I think it was. This is to illustrate that the very industry that all those ditches were designed to help, and they did, it actually destabilizes that business model. If you're using herbicides instead of control burn, if you're planting them 1,000, 1,200, 1,400 stems per acre and you're building up that fuel load, and you don't have the natural fire breaks anymore, the wetlands, you get massive billions and billions of dollars worth of loss. We've got a friend in the legislature who said this way back in 02, and uh, this is still an issue in the Blackwater Springs. Now, I don't know how serious Representative Smith is about fixing the problem, but maybe we'll get a chance to find out one day soon. So this is my last slide, and I want to flip back to the aquifer for a minute. One of the things that happens in the Darty Plain when you get a really wet year like this is that the Florida aquifer almost recharges. Now it hadn't been fully <coughs> recharged in about 35 years because it's so depleted. But it almost completely recharges, which means it's an almost completely renewable resource. Even though we're seeing this huge damage on the surface with these creeks, um, the, the resource itself for that farm production is still there on a, on a dependable basis. So that's an interesting political dynamic. 
because you've got a you've got a fairly sustainable agricultural economy in the Darty Plain. But as soon as you get east of the Pelham Escarpment, it's a different story. Because what's going on, and this is a well at Sylvester and one here at Tifton, is that we're mining water. Just like they are in the Central California Valley, and just like they are on the High Plains, in the, out of the Ogallala Aquifer. We're actually mining water. Now what mining water means is it's not going to be replaced. You can't get it back. And it's because that recharge in the Darty Plain doesn't happen. It doesn't happen fast enough at the current rate of use to help folks that are downgrading. Now, how fast are we mining? This is a classic glass half full, half empty question. There's another 200 feet of resource underneath, roughly, underneath what we've already mined. We've only mined about 10% of it. So at the present rate of use, if you, if you think we've been using it, or you admit to yourself we've been using this thing 25 or 30 years, let's just say 20 and be conservative. Uh, nine times 20, 180 years. We've got 180 years of resource here, so maybe we don't need to be worried. But the fact is, we're mining. And that, that needs to be foremost in everybody's mind, because I hope that we're managing Georgia for Georgians well beyond the 200-year mark. That's, that's my hope. And I've already illustrated to you that we have a surface water problem in the Darty Plain. And we have surface water problems here in the Tip Plateau. These are, these are our, our bellwethers. These, these are our signals that we need to be paying attention to what's going on. Just because we can continue to pump at the present rates doesn't mean we should. There's a lot of activity to make this thing more efficient, a lot. There's a lot of research going on at a lot of different institutions to make pivot, center pivot agriculture much more efficient than it is now. And that's working, that research is working. But if you continue to hand out permits and continue to dig new wells, then you can negate the efficiency very fast. 10% increase in efficiency over 10 wells can be negated by one permit. So that's where I'm going in, and I'll turn it over to my friend Neil to talk about the political side of this. 